Good afternoon. My name is James K. Holder II. Some of you may know me as Sir James II, and I'd like to welcome you back to Not On My Watch. Make sure to join us here every Wednesday at noon for the latest episode. I'd like to ask you to first subscribe to this, po- this cast. I'd like to ask you to like, share, and comment. I want you to retweet this and repeat this. My goal is to just offer a progressive platform where everyone has a seat at this table. And this is just sort of an alternative um, option to mainstream media. Many of us are kind of weary of that platform uh, since the election of 2016. And that was the genesis of this particular program. So make sure you subscribe. Uh, Today is March 8th, 2017. And I'd like to say happy International Women's Day. Uh, This is also Women's History Month. And today I am wearing red. Well, this is kind of coral. This is the closest thing I had to red. And also uh, it's getting unseasonably warm here in Atlanta. And so I figured this is probably my last opportunity to wear uh, this heavy of a sweater um, (laughs) in celebration of uh, the Women's Strike, which is happening on today. March 8th, I mean, March 8th, 2017. Um, now, the March, the, the, the women's strike, as I understand it, is sort of an extension of the women's march. Uh, it is a, a day without women. So women are being encouraged to uh, stay home from work or abstain from spending or other, you know, other contributions to our daily which let people know the impact that women have in our society and therefore that women should be valued. And I absolutely want to support that in any way I possibly can. Now, for women who find themselves in a check-to-check type situation or poor situation where you can't absolutely afford to take the day off of work, if you happen to be watching this before noon where you're already at work, um, I'd say no pressure. Don't feel obligated to risk your job or your livelihood or your family's livelihood or well-being uh, to accommodate this particular movement. I think it's more about um, showing a solidarity and there's ways you can do that. Uh, some of it, it might be, you might not take the whole day off of work. You might just take a half day. You might just, you know, take an extended lunch. Uh, I think a good way of doing it is to not spend money. I think that is, uh, if, if there is a significant showing that products that, uh, that are geared towards women, the sales drop on, on March 8th, I think that is a good show of solidarity. So, you know, I think when, we, when it comes to uh, pressures and intersectionality, uh, where especially women of color feel, you know, pressured to sort of abide by this Uh, movement, there might be a little bit of challenge. But I want to support in any way I can, and I encourage you, if you're able, to definitely participate um, in any way that you possibly can. So with that said, there will also be a special feature of a woman from Women's History Month at the end of this program, and I'd like you to, you know, definitely stay focused and tuned in for that. So... Let's get right into just the crux of today. Again, it's Wednesday. Yesterday, we, well, really like overnight, Monday into Tuesday, it was revealed the plan of the American Health Care Act, which is uh, the GOP's replacement to um, the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare. Um, And this sort of... was the news cycle of Tuesday, right? We all sort of are, are, are scurrying around trying to figure out what does this mean for us? What does it mean for, for poor people? What does it mean for the elderly? And so I will be completely transparent with you in the fact that I have not read this entire bill. I don't know all of the things that it entails or how it relates to um, Obamacare specifically, but there were some key elements that I wanted to focus he- on here and highlight for you just because I feel like these are the relevant um, issues that affect our daily lives. So, um, one, conservative estimates place that this plan will lead to a, anywhere from 6 million to 10 million Americans 
to lose coverage. Now, obviously, uh, the Affordable Care Act received criticism by GOP and uh, far left voters in the last election cycle because it didn't cover enough Americans. Many people thought, okay, well, it doesn't cover enough and it's too expensive and the prices keep going up. And so they thought it needed some reform. Whatever that was, obviously this plan does not solve that particular criticism. It is actually a regression from uh, the Obamacare law that we currently have in place. Um, where does that, what causes that? Now, there's two major contributors to that loss of coverage. One is that where before in the Affordable Care Act, it allowed for sort of insurance companies to kind of balance out um, the risk of younger, sort of healthier uh, insurance purchasers and um, older, more elderly and tend to be more, you know, sick and have more, more health expenses as you age, um, that those two premiums sort of met in the middle, right? So you had an increased spending here for younger people and therefore there was a reduction in, in, in age. However, as you age, if you're benefiting from that reduction, then you're kind of benefiting from the entire system. So there was, that was one thing that is contributing because that coupled with the loss of the Medicaid expansion per state uh, you know, request, it will ultimately lead to uh, less people being covered over a, a fairly short period of time. Um, uh, moving along, this also contributes to the elimination of the Medicare, Medicaid expansion. Now, this is what sort of Paul Ryan has been gunning for since day one, right? Like this whole, let's send it to the states. Let's reduce culpability of federal government. Let's shrink federal government, all this other sort of nonsense. But what all this ultimately contributes to is a major, major tax break for the wealthiest Americans, uh, many of whom contributed to Trump's campaign and voted for Donald Trump. Um, it also ultimately contributes to a less um, secure health network because if fewer people are insured and you have more people who are susceptible to one, um, communicable diseases and viruses, that leaves us all more vulnerable, right? But then two, if you have people who are reverting back to what happened, before, what we saw before Obamacare took place, where people were relying on emergency room care to get coverage because they're not insured, and these tend to be elderly, homeless, people who don't really have like a, a set sort of family network or even sort of a, a friendly network around to support financially when times get rough, you end up having these people who rely on emergency care and that ultimately burdens all of us at the end of the day. So that was some of the stuff that Obamacare aimed to reverse and this system is going to regress back to those initial problems that we had. Now, um, the only other thing I want to discuss is uh, there was one major sort of concern and this is something that Trump always promised would happen. You know, he... In, even as recently as last week when he gave his um, joke sessions with Jeff Sessions, as you I covered last week, uh, he really focused on saying that this program would have lower premiums, it would, have, um, it would keep the coverage for uh, uh, American citizens with pre-existing conditions, which was one of the greatest triumphs of, of, of the Obamacare uh, plan. And uh, so I want to kind of dissect that a little bit. And without going into really specific numbers, um, what this plan does is effectively offers a substantial tax cut and uh, financial windfall for insurance companies, right? It allows for uh, many of the men who met with Donald Trump last week in, his, in the Oval Office, and they photographed very well, uh, just before uh, Kellyanne Conardis' uh, cameo photo shoot uh, where she was on her knees on the sofa in the White House. Right before that, there, were a, there was another photo taken where there were about, I don't remember, about 12 of the uh, CEOs of the top insurance providers in the country, and, and it, it was accompanied by a tweet from Donald Trump. I cannot tell you verbatim what this tweet said, but it ultimately said, I'm meeting with these CEOs to discuss the future of healthcare in America. And what this whole tweet seemed to sort of uh, ignore is the fact that 
Health, health insurance providers don't provide care for Americans. They provide health insurance coverage, which is separate from actual doctors and what doctors would say is best for American patients and the uh, well-being of American citizens. And so I think that was a huge missed point, but I don't know how missed it was because I'm sure many of those people in that room with Donald Trump uh, are benefiting from this plan where you are seeing the ability to discriminate against elderly. Uh, you know, while you might not be able to block out someone who has a pre-existing condition, uh, there is one specific provision and change to that um, that will lead to an increase of uh, fee for people, especially people with pre-existing conditions. So as we know, one of the major triumphs of that, of Obamacare, was the pre-existing condition clause, where Someone can't be denied if they're applying during the marketplace, which happens every year around November to November through December for people to apply for um, health coverage without being asked about uh, a prior condition or any other like what their uh, prescriptions are or anything like that. You just have the option to sign up for new coverage and it's the same price for everybody. Now, um, where it gets hazy is that last, the, in order to uh, get people to, uh, essentially, if you're offering insurance to people who are sick, then you have to make sure that there are enough people who aren't sick who are on insurance, right? Because if only sick people are on insurance, then it creates this atmosphere that is unsustainable for insurance companies or unsustainable. Um, but ultimately, it really means that we need people to get on insurance and have, be insured whether or not they are in need of significant uh, care and significant support in the, their, uh, the finances of their care. And so one of the provisions of the Obamacare Act was to place a penalty um, for individuals of uh, $695. So every year, if you're an individual who did not have health insurance, or if you had health insurance and it lapsed for more than uh, 90 days, then you would ultimately be responsible for paying for a $695 uh, penalty, which was a commensurate with what you, know, what you could expect to pay for health insurance. So basically, if you skipped out on three months of health insurance, then you'd pay about the value of three months of that health insurance on your tax bill at the end of the year, which kind of makes sense, right? It's not really a penalty because this money ultimately should have gone to your insurance provider had you been covered all year like we want you to be. So it was kind of a, a, a balance there. Um, this particular... Act, the AHCA, um, aka Trump Care, uh, removes that particular penalty but replaces it with a provision that says if you go for over 63 calendar days without health insurance, and this is assuming that your health insurance lapses at the end of the year. Um, so, what some people would do, and I'm not advocating for this, but some people who live check to check um, in prior years of Obamacare would do, they would, be ha they would sign up on the marketplace in uh, December or anywhere from November to the end of January to get covered for the year. And then as the year went on, if they were healthy enough and didn't need, didn't require support, you know, in November and December, they might let, let their health insurance lapse in November, December, avoid the $695 penalty or whatever your family penalty was. Um, the max family penalty, of course, was um, $2,085 um, under Obamacare. Now that's been replaced with sort of a, an annual fee. So if your coverage lapses for more than 63 days, meaning you, you went beyond that December, that November, December lapsing, uh, what would happen is, what will happen under this new plan is that you will be charged a 30% increase over the next year for your insurance premiums. Now, what does that mean? That means instead of a flat $695 fee that you would have paid as an individual, you're ultimately paying basically a third more for your coverage for the next year as a penalty. So there's still a penalty. There's still this uh, financial in, um, uh, sort of detractor to um, having coverage, which is what the Republicans said was sort of unconstitutional. This was the, all of the suits against Obamacare were claims that this was unconstitutional because it levied a fee, and then it was like, oh, well, this fee also goes to funding P Planned Parenthood and now to support abortion, and so on and so forth. Um, so 
let me tell you where this breaks down. Uh, effectively, if, as an individual, now I didn't do this for families, but as an individual, if you paid more than $2,300 around, $2,317 per year for your health insurance premiums, this new plan, and most people do by the way, because that's about $200 a month. That's a little less than $200 a month. I think most people pay more than that for insurance. I couldn't give you just off the top of my head what the average is, but I'm assuming the average you know, health insurance bill monthly is about $350, uh, depending on your age, depending on uh, the type of coverage and the, the deductible you choose. But effectively, if your annual premiums were less than, if your annual premiums are more than $2,317, you're going to be penalized more financially as a risk uh, under this plan. And that would, I would, that would obviously cover most Americans. Um, and just to move along from this, because I don't, you know, this could be a whole mini series. We could talk about this for weeks, and there's definitely more implications, implications when it comes to prescription medications, uh, what's offered, what isn't offered. Um, ultimately, what we're seeing with this plan is there's a trend to supporting uh, big pharma. There's a, a trend to supporting the insurance companies and their financial interests and not the financial interests of Americans, despite the claim that Obamacare was bankrupting, you know, middle America and white working class and all this other stuff. So um, I invite you to look into that. Um, I, again, I'm not into pubbing sources, but um, Vox actually had a pretty detailed point by point uh, coverage of this. And uh, the reason, and I, Vox is a, is a liberal publication in my view, you know, they're considerably liberal, um, but they did do, they broke it down to the point where you could go on that page and kind of see exactly where it affected you. And so that's why I recommend you sort of Google them and find uh, uh, what they're saying about this particular uh, plan as it will affect you. The good news is that um, with any law that you sign in, some aspects might take effect immediately, but ultimately if you're already on the marketplace and you're insured, it's not really going to impact you and your family until perhaps January 1, 2018, right? And as it is, again, sort of not knowing the details of how specific prescriptions are going to be covered, specific uh, care facilities are going to be covered, or whether you'll have to switch providers, um, the good news is that if you have to encumber a higher penalty or your premiums go up a little bit because you're older, that might be very challenging for elderly voters, I mean elderly Americans um, in 2018, but 2018 is also an election year. And so what that allows us the opportunity to do is make sure that we get our shit together, let's, let's cut all this petty bickering about how Hillary Clinton was imperfect and how Tom Perez is imperfect and just buckle down and resolve this issue and make sure that we're protecting our elderly, we're protecting our sick, we're protecting those with uh, pre-existing conditions, whether it be cancer, whether it be uh, cystic fibrosis, whether it's sickle cell anemia, whether it's HIV AIDS, whatever that may be, we need to work to make sure that uh, American citizens are being protected under the law. And so 2018 is going to be a critical year because again, all of this stuff is kind of coming to a head. And also as charted by this law, the Medicaid expansion would ultimately be sort of uh, eviscerated by 2020. And so, like I said, if we get our shit together by 2018 and switch our house over to a democratic control, we might be able to get past this relatively unscathed. So that's something to be optimistic about. On another high note, uh, fun fact, it actually costs me 4.83 iPhones a year to be insured. <laughs> so if and obviously this is in response to Jason Chavitz's uh, ridiculous uh, welfare queen assertion on Americans who need health coverage that they'd have to sacrifice their new iPhones to get health coverage. And so we obviously know that we pay way more for health insurance annually than we do for new iPhones every two years when they come out or three years. Actually, I still have an iPhone, what is it, it's iPhone 6 plus? It's still going pretty well. So uh, I don't plan to get a new phone for a little while until this one, the wheels fall off of this baby. Um, but if you want to know how many iPhones you pay every year in health insurance to send to uh, Jason Chavitz for him to know, it, you can go to howmanyiphonesdoesitcost.com. <laughs> and that will allow you to 
to put in your information. Uh, you don't have to give them too much information, but you can just put in your, your annual premium and it will translate to how many iPhones that is annually. And it will also send an automatic tweet to Jason Chaffetz for him to understand how many iPhones it costs Americans to be insured. Um, so that was just a little fun fact. I encourage you to try that out. Uh, trolling is a form of activism these days. So at, as much as you control these GOP people, um, I say go for it. Um, moving right along to the GOP and their dastardly deeds uh, and machinations and shenanigans. Uh, Georgia, the Georgia state legislature has passed a new gerrymandering provision. Thank you. Um, and if you don't know what gerrymandering is uh, from your ninth grade political science class or from you know, your college course or whatever, gerrymandering is effectively an illegal practice used by fundamentally the GOP uh, where they allow politicians to determine who their voters are rather than the voters determining who their politicians are. Under this system, uh, geographic regions are divided by demographics that are favorable to a politician in order to regain or, or retain power within a certain political house. This is a tool of the GOP, and this is why, despite the fact that in an election like 2016, where you had approximately 1.8 million more votes for House seats on the Democratic side, the GOP actually gained seats because the way those votes were portioned out by the districts, um, the Democrats actually lost power. And this is something that continually happens. Again, if you don't know what gerrymandering is, there are many diagrams that can explain what this looks like and why it's a problem. It basically says that the, under these practices that Georgia is in, uh, in the process of, of passing in the dead of night, um, it, assuming that GOP uh, Governor Nathan Deal of Georgia goes forward with this um, and signing it into law this week, um, that black people will be disenfranchised under this law in terms of who their representatives are at the state legislature level and as, as well as in the House of Representatives. And it's significant specifically within the House of Representatives because those are elections that are determined by your district. So if you're not voting uh, in mass for someone who you want to support, ultimately you're going to end up with representation that you don't want. And that's obviously not good for our country um, and our uh, democracy. Um, yeah, so that was that. Um, also, in the state of Montana, one thing that should be understood is that they have only one congressional district. So they don't really suffer from gerrymandering in a sense. However, what's happening in there is that they have to have a special election because one of their representatives was appointed um, in, I think, within Trump's cabinet or some position within Trump's administration to where that seat is vacated and they have to replace it. Of course, that was a GOP uh, representative. They want to replace it with another GOP. But the, the, many of the Republicans who control the state, state legislature there are now demanding that um, they don't do a mail-in ballot. And Rachel Maddow covered this the other day. And this is significant because mail-in ballots are a really affordable way to protect the franchise of all voters within a state. Obviously, there aren't a lot of black people in Montana, but, um, you know, they're there. I think we're talking about Montana. Irregardless, what we'll have is that they want to have an election that's going to cost the state in excess of a million dollars to ensure that this GOP seat remains, you know, with the House. So it's important to understand the inner workings of these decisions. You know, you got to vote in local elections because these people that we elect, regardless of how the legalities of their election, um, ultimately leads to the types of things that determine if we have a House majority, if we have a House minority. And we know that we need a House majority in 2018 to possibly begin impeachment proceedings against GOP Donald Trump because... We can't rely on the Republicans to be fair in assessments of uh, sort of the inner workings and things that are discovered in any uh, hearings uh, with Russia ties, which will come up very shortly. Um, so as a citizen of your state, city, district, county, I want to encourage you today to uh, log on to vote411.org 
Um, this is a website uh, sponsored by the League of Women Voters. And what it does is basically you get to type in your address and it will tell you what elections and uh, primaries are coming up in your district. Uh, specifically in Georgia, District 6 is, uh, is uh, going over a House seat uh, that could again be another seat in that possible direction. So between Montana and Georgia, we're talking about two seats. And John Ossoff is the Democratic candidate who is uh, Dreamy John, I think is what he's being dubbed. He's been called the Justin Trudeau of Atlanta, whatever that means. So look into John. I'm not necessarily endorsing him because I don't know what his platform is. But um, he seems to be pro-ACA, anti-AHCA, a.k.a. Trump care. Um, and so that would be something I'd encourage you to look into today. Just do that really quickly and uh, get that over with so that you know that you're not missing an opportunity to uh, express your voice. So as I said before, it is uh, International Women's Day and, um, and it's also Women's History Month. So I wanted to kind of just focus on one individual that I think is particularly significant uh, to understand in what we're going through now in our country. Um, Harriet Tubman. Now, Harriet Tubman was an, uh, an abolitionist. She was, um, uh, effectively, she worked for the Union Army during the uh, Civil War. Uh, she led many uh, slave families to freedom um, in the North and also in Canada across the border. Uh, she was a no-nonsense woman. She uh, deserves recognition. And I think what, you know, we all know that Harry Tubman worked uh, in the Underground Railroad. We know that, you know, many speculate that she linked up with Frederick Douglass at some point to help free slaves. Uh, and so she sort of meets this at a really, really pivotal intersection of American history where you have a woman who was born a slave and chose to devote her life and risk her life to not only work to free others who were born into her similar condition, but also work with the, the Union um, Army to win the war, also worked with, other, with fellow abolitionists of, of the opposite gender to free you know, uh, Americans and work to a specific end, right? We also know that she was a, uh, a, a um, she worked alongside the uh, abolitionist movement. I mean, not abolition movement, I'm sorry, but the, uh, the women's suffrage movement. So despite the fact, you know, we talk about intersectionality, we talk about white feminism, oftentimes in a negative. But uh, this is someone who, despite that, really contributed more and more and more. It wasn't enough to be free. It wasn't enough to have agency over your own family and, and, and self. As an American, you also had to have the right to vote as a woman. So this is someone who devoted their life to protecting the franchise, not only for black people and freedom for black people, but also uh, for women, all women. And so I think that she should be celebrated today, every day. Uh, now we know that last year it was determined that she would be, she would replace Andrew Jackson on the $20 bill. That has yet to come to fruition, as she is not on the $20 bill in my pocket right now. But we'll hope that despite the fact that we have, uh, you know, this sort of alt-right situation going on as the powers that be, that that will come to fruition. And I don't, uh, forgive me if that has already been determined that will, that will not proceed. Uh, I hope that that will be something that we will see and that she will be understood and cherished as a, as a national treasure and supporter of all of our rights, not just a, a, a champion for black people, um, because she is truly, truly a hero and uh, deserves recognition. Other good news, um, I, <laughs> and this is just a highlight, I actually plan to spend much more time on this, uh, but here we are. The House Intelligence Committee announced yesterday that they have set the, the date of their first Russia hearings uh, in terms of determining whether Donald Trump colluded with the Russians uh, to become elected the 45th president of the United States of America, um, a.k.a. Uh, uh, what were those nicknames? Liar in Chief, um, P-O-S-O-T-U-S. -S. I'll let you figure out what that acronym stands for. Um, there was also Prime Sinister of the United States um, and many other names that we could call this person who, you know, 
most of us didn't choose to be uh, our governing uh, head of state. But what's notable about these hearings is that there will be public hearings, um, much like the Flint hearings that we saw that really didn't lead, lead to anywhere. But the gathering of information by witnesses, um, it is not yet determined, or I don't know, that Donald Trump will be a witness in these hearings. I imagine that at some point he will be called to trial to testify. And we know that man, if he's breathing, he's lying. So lying under oath, if nothing else, should get him uh, Call to question is whether he's going to get impeached. But um, two notable witnesses are James Comey, <laughs> the director of the FBI, who I don't know how he's still employed, but James Comey knows enough. Um, and, uh, you know, we know from previous interactions with Jim, Jim Comey over the last sort of six months that there's something fishy going on and that he knows stuff and is privy to stuff that the American public doesn't know. So I'm looking forward to that. Also, recently fired Deputy Attorney General Sally Yates, um, who was fired by Donald Trump when she refused to uphold his uh, ridiculous Muslim ban. And now we saw this week that Muslim ban 2.0 has taken effect. And I didn't go into that. Also didn't go into the wiretapping because you all know about all that stuff. But those are two um, sort of people that I'm looking to hear what they have to say because I think they have a lot to contribute to this discussion. So look out for that, March 20th, 28, 2017, mark your calendars. That's just under two weeks. And considering that the ACA, the AHCA plan uh, that uh, Mitch McConnell is hoping to rush that through uh, before the April recess of Congress, um, Ideally, we'll get some really, really, really substantive data from this hearing on March 20th that will forestall that whole thing. Because as far as I'm concerned, Trump uh, is an illegitimate president until we determine that he was fairly elected. And right now, there's a lot of questions in the air. So he really shouldn't be signing executive orders. He really be, shouldn't be signing new laws into to play. We really need to just... Uh, ban all Trump legislation until our country's representatives can figure out what the hell is going on, in his own words. That's what I feel like we should be doing right now. Um, separate from that, I always want to recognize our friends to the show. Today, I want to give a special shout out to Josh M. of Atlanta, Georgia, um, for supporting this program, Not On My Watch. As we've discussed, uh, you know, you can visit the PayPal link that is either on the website at holderstudio.com. Uh, the, the, the link to this PayPal uh, support system is actually uh, paypal.me slash jkh2. There you can enter any amount from $1 to help me buy coffee for this program to whatever your heart's content is to help me, you know, invest in this program and really invest in sort of stuff that will help me uh, streamline this. So, um, you know, if you have any specific questions, you can always reach out to me via any of my um, Twitter accounts. My personal Twitter account is at JKH2. The Twitter account for the show is at NotOnMyWatchTV. Um, so I invite you to follow me on both of those. Again, I'd like to ask you to like, share, comment, retweet, and repeat this post. And I'd like you to lastly subscribe to this page because um, I definitely want to continue to spread this message. I want to thank you for tuning in. As always, I'd like you to see me back here uh, every Wednesday by noon. Uh, last week I was a little bit late because I had a little glitch on my computer. But I am working on that and have uh, <laughs> invested enough stuff to make sure that doesn't continue to happen. Um, so I appreciate you. I want you to continue to watch. As always, I'd like to ask you to relax, relate, and resist. Thank you. Too complex.